Welcome to the Kentucky Watershed Academy. I'm Steve Evans with the Kentucky Water Resources Research Institute. And in this episode of Module 2, Water Quality Basics, we'll be looking at aquatic biology. In this series, we've been gradually climbing the stream functions pyramid. And in this episode, we're going to look at the top of the pyramid, biology. Biology is located at the top of the pyramid because these functions are dependent upon all of the underlying functions. Biological functions include biodiversity or the variety of organisms, as well as the life histories of aquatic and riparian organisms. This includes the types of organisms that feed in an area, reproduce an area, or spend some part of their life cycle in the water and the habitat surrounding it. Biological functions can affect lower level functions. For example, a beaver can affect the geomorphology and the hydraulics of the stream. However, as with other levels, the dominant cause and effect relationship is upward. A healthy aquatic ecosystem must have sufficient water contributed from the watershed, the right levels of hydraulic forces, proper bed and diversity and, ch and channel stability, suitable temperature and oxygen regimes, and so on. The value of the pyramid at this level is that it helps regulators, scientists, and engineers to identify the underlying functions that must be present in order to achieve improvements in biological quality. So when we look at the biological functions, we're looking at the prevailing uh, or current existing uh, conditions that are necessary to sustain life for aquatic and riparian organisms such as algae, fish, and benthic macroinvertebrates. The river continuum concept generalizes the way in which biological communities function depending on the size of the stream or the river. Depending on the size of the stream, different communities of organisms are expected to live in different places. The ecosystem functions differently based on the upstream drainage area, from the smaller drainage areas of first to third order streams to the larger drainage areas of seventh to twelfth order streams. The drainage area contributes to the hydrological and geomorphological conditions, which affect the stream's ability to provide habitat and support different types of organisms. Smaller headwater streams are dependent on a variety of microorganisms to convert energy from organic matter entering the stream. These include shredders, grazers, collectors, and a few predators. In larger streams, more algal production is occurring in the water itself, which changes the composition of the organisms that it can support and allows for greater biodiversity. In even larger systems, the increased diversity of aquatic light supports a range of zooplankton and other fine particle collectors that can support larger fish and other aquatic animals. A wide variety of factors contribute to the ability of a water body to support aquatic life. This graphic summarizes some of the factors which can potentially impact aquatic life. This includes the flow regime. If streams dry up due to insufficient groundwater flow and increased droughts, or if floodwater velocities sweep macroinvertebrates downstream, the aquatic ecosystem can be impacted. Habitat structure is also important. Some aquatic organisms can only live in areas with specific habitats like old wood or root wads. Others might need open spaces under rocks and riffles, which could get clogged with sediment. There's also biotic factors. Uh, some species require specific spawning habitats or a specific host. Others may require specific conditions during portions of their life cycle. And a community can be impacted by disease as well. There's also energy sources. Is there sufficient sunlight or leaf input during the, the seasonal fall cycle to sustain uh, the food source for the organisms? And then there's water chemistry. Is there sufficient dissolved oxygen? Are, are the nutrient levels too excessive? Is there metals toxicity in the water? It's the biologist's job to try to figure out what may be causing a weakness and uh, it impacting the biological community. The question of what makes a healthy stream is open to some debate and depends to some extent on the values of the society. Some people think that all streams should be like they were believed to be prior to European settlement. Some think that as long as something or anything can live in it, the stream is just fine. Some people will be happy if all streams were concreted over as long as they kept their house from flooding. Stream scientists cannot collect chemical samples all the time because the cost for analyzing all the potential pollutants would be too expensive. And collection at a given time does not explain what happens when the scientist is not there. So how can we judge whether a stream is healthy? Should we compare it to pre-European settlement conditions? Is there enough 
to show that the current organisms are resilient and sustainable. How much life should be present? How many types of organisms? Does their life cycle and their feeding cycle or their rarity or sensitivity to pollution, does that matter? It would be nice if we could interview some of the aquatic organisms and just ask them if they think their community is healthy, but unfortunately we can't do that. So what alternatives are available for biologists? Well, when we look at human communities, such as cities or workplaces, we're regularly seeing new rankings all the time that are looking at different indicators in the community to evaluate whether it's healthy or not. And the same approach can be used with the biological community. Biological indicator organisms are used to help scientists understand what's impacting the stream during the times when scientists are not there to observe or to take measurements. This helps give a better understanding of water quality by through conducting a biological survey and assessment, and then looking at the different organism types, quantity, ratios, to indicate uh, what is that, uh, what is, how is that related to different uh, water quality impacts. When using indicator organisms to develop a biotic index, there are four basic steps that help determine whether a stream is healthy or not. Understanding this process will help you understand how the biology acts as an indicator of health. These steps are as follows. Streams with minimal human impact or reference reaches are identified. Reference reaches include streams of different sizes in different geographical regions of the state. Streams provide benchmark conditions that can be compared to water quality conditions in the test site streams of the same region. A wide variety of parameters are collected at these reference sites as well as the streams of interest. Statistical analysis is then used to assess the different metrics or ways of looking at the biological data to find the best predictors of different types of pollution impacts. Some of these met metrics are better in some areas of the state than in others. These different metrics are calculated into an overall score that provides confidence that the results are statistically different from the least impacted area, these reference reaches. This allows for the development of metric values for rating comparison streams and telling us whether an area is healthy versus unhealthy. In Kentucky, the way that biological health is determined is dependent on the stream's location within a specific bioregion and its size class, whether it's considered weightable with a watershed between five and 200 square miles or a headwater stream with a watershed of less than five square miles. The graphic shows where each region was sampled in order to develop the metrics for macroinvertebrates. Kentucky has four bioregions. From west to east, this includes the Mississippi Valley Interior River, or the MVIR, the Penny Rile, marked with a PR, the Bluegrass, marked with a VG, and the Mountain, marked with an MT. It's important to compare the biotic index you calculated for your site to the correct bioregion scale on the integrity rating chart. The chart provided is divided into eight different sections and include the four bioregions and two different size classes, weightable and headwater. The scales of the chart are adjusted for the variances in the actual biological communities found in each of the different bioregions. For example, if your biological sample is collected from a site in the mountains and you calculate your bio biologic index, but you accidentally compare it to the integrity rating for the bluegrass, you can misinterpret the integrity rating for your stream as good when in reality for the mountains it's only fair. There are several different biological indicators that can be used including fish or algae, but one of the best indicators are benthic macroinvertebrates. Well, what does that mean? Benthic means simply that an organism lives on the bottom, macro is large enough to be seen with the naked eye, and invertebrate means an animal without a background, backbone. Benthic macroinvertebrates play an important role in a stream system. They provide a food source for larger animals, especially fish. Some of these macroinvertebrates eat algae and bacteria. Others shred and eat leaves uh, and others decaying material that enters the stream. By feeding on and using the nutrients in these materials, benthic macroinvertebrates make these nutrients available to the larger animals that eat them. Also, when they die and decay, the nutrients in their bodies become food for other benthic macroinvertebrates in the stream. 
Literally thousands of different species of macroinvertebrates have been found in Kentucky's streams and rivers. In general, when seeking ideal indicators of watershed health, we are looking for the following characteristics. Species should live in the water for all or most of their lives. They should stay in areas suitable for their survival. They're easy to collect. Different species, so different tolerance uh, to different pollution levels. They're easy to identify in the field or the lab. They often live more than a year. They don't move very far in the stream. And they're exposed to all the conditions and pollution in the stream. In addition, uh, these different types of organisms uh, can be categorized in different ways in order to form metrics. And these metrics uh, can include the abundance, the frequency, the pollution sensitivity, the feeding group, life cycle type, and key habitat. In Kentucky, there are three different types of organisms that are used in biological assessments, fish, benthic macroinvertebrates, and algae diatoms. Of these, benthic macroinvertebrates provide the most robust uh, indicator for the health of a stream. Well, what can the macroinvertebrate community tell us about water quality? Well, if the suspended sediment is too high, it can cause difficulty breathing through their gills, or if the bed sediment smothers their egg or habitat niches between the rocks and the gravel, then they won't have a place to live. If the dissolved oxygen levels are too low, it makes it difficult for them to thrive and to reproduce. Further, warmer temperatures can cause stress by reducing the dissolved oxygen levels and increasing the susceptibility to disease. And uh, conductivity uh, can negatively impact some species if the level becomes elevated. The presence of macroinvertebrates that employ a range of feeding types indicates a healthy aquatic community that maximizes resources and, and completes the food web. There are a variety of ways that macroinvertebrates collect and consume their food and energy resources. Shredders get their energy from breaking down uh, leaves and other vegetation. It may include stoneflies, craneflies, caddisfly larvae, and sow bugs. Grazers or scrapers scrape the algae and other food sources off of rocks in the stream sub substrate. That it may include mayfly larvae or snails. Collectors crawl around and pick up small pieces of vegetation and debris from the bottom of the stream, for example, uh, beetles or worms. Also, there are uh, filtering collectors that filter food out of the water column. Examples are blackfly larvae or net building caddisflies. There's also predators that eat macroinvertebrates and small fish, and they have mouth parts that are specifically adapted to feed on prey. Examples may be dragonfly or damselfly larvae that have a scoop like lower jaws. Macroinvertebrates also display a wide range of mobility and use of various habitats that exist in a stream environment. These are some examples of places you can find macroinvertebrates in the water column, on the stream bed, and along the stream banks. For instance, clingers, such as a water penny or a caddisfly larvae, are attached to substrates such as rocks. Skaters move on the surface of the water. Swimmers or climbers will move in short bursts and crawl on aquatic plants, roots, or woody debris. An example of that would be uh, water boatman beetles, which a fun fact is they breathe from a bubble of air that they keep underneath of their bodies. Burrowers dig into the fine settlements. An example of that is the rat-tailed maggot. Uh, a fun fact is that the tail-like structure is actually used to help the maggot breathe in low oxygen environments. Because they can survive in extreme environments, they are useful as indicators of non-ideal water quality conditions. Feeding and habitat groupings are combined with other factors to develop correlations with water quality within specific ecological regions. These indicators help provide a general understanding of the water quality conditions and alert stream scientists to the potential problems in need of attention or higher water quality in need of protection. Some species of benthic macroinvertebrates are more sensitive to pollution than others. And so they can be grouped by their sensitivity to pollution. The presence of a stream of many or all of, of the individuals in the sensitive group would indicate good water quality. However, a variety of macroinvertebrates from each group should be found in a healthy stream. The EPT index measures water quality uh, uh, 
based on the abundance of three major orders of stream insects that have low tolerance to pollutants in the stream environment. That's Ephemeroptera, that's the E, Plecoptera, that's the P, and Trichoptera. That includes the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. It's calculated by dividing the total number of taxa for each of these uh, species by the total taxa found uh, uh, at the site and multiplying by 100. So that's the percent EPT abundance. A high percentage of EPT taxa indicates good water quality. The other non-EPT examples on this slide have varying levels of sensitivity to pollution. If only a few individuals or none of the sensitive group are present in a stream, the macroinvertebrates are mostly from the moderate, moderately tolerant or pollution tolerant groups. This would get a, indicate fair water quality. If most of the macroinvertebrates present are from the pollution tolerant group, then poor water quality would be pre would be indicated. Here are some indicators of poor water quality. This is a simplified diagram of how the Kentucky Division of Water decides whether or not a waterway is impaired for warm water or cold water aquatic habitat use. The idea is that all types of biological data are reviewed. Sometimes all of this data tells the same story: the waterway is either healthy or impaired. Scores of excellent and good from these biological indicators uh, usually relate to supporting their, their use. Scores of fair or poor or very poor usually relate to some form of impairment. If it's impaired, the Kentucky Division of Water tries to associate probable causes to the impairment through analysis of the chemical, physical, and habitat data. However, if there's a conflict between the biological data the macroinvertebrates, the habitat, the fish, and the algae, and the pollutant data. Then a weight of evidence approach is used uh, or resampling is done. In order to improve the biology and restore these uses, the hydrology and the geomorphology will need to be addressed as well as the pollutants. Hopefully this provides you with a basic overview of how aquatic biology is used to assess the stream health and how that aquatic biology is reliant upon a whole host of functions in that stream functional pyramid, including the hydrology, the hydraulics, the geomorphology, the habitat, the water quality, in order to support a robust aquatic community.